God does some epic things in the Bible as we read them. In John 3, 16 and 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Like, you know this, right? John 3, 16 may be the most famous verse in the Bible. Oddly enough, probably the most famous verse in the Bible because people used to hold up signs at football games behind the goalposts, like during the extra point. John 3.16. And it didn't say what John 3.16 said. It just said John 3.16. I think it was the Mormons that were doing that. I, I could be wrong. But people would look it up. That was probably largely before we were all carrying phones. But like, you'd be there watching. What does that say, John 3.16? Like, people would be reading that that had nothing to do with God and would learn. And as we look at this passage, it's so powerful. It speaks into everything I just said. Really. For God, for God so loved the world. Everybody in the world. That he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Man, you know, for the church, especially for those that are very mature in the church, like, like the elders and people... Um, you know, you know if you're mature in your faith or not. Uh, we should be all about this, helping people encounter John 3.16, you know, because it's about Jesus and him leading people to salvation. You know, God gave his one and only son. Now, some people will take this, like there are people that are, King James is the only Bible. It's like the authorized version, right? That's the only thing. Well, the King James doesn't say this. The King James says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And though, this is one of the verses that they'll use to say, this is why the NIV is wrong and the King James is the only correct Bible because of things like that. And when King James people say that to me, and there's nothing wrong with the King James, unless you think it's the only Bible that you could possibly read, right? So when people are like that, when I encounter people that are King James only, what I'll tell them is, do you know that the word begotten doesn't exist in Greek? It could not have been in the original writings because the word was added in English. Now, it was added for good reason to help people comprehend. But this wording, whether you say only begotten son or one and only son or something similar, the point of the message is that Jesus was a one of a kind, unique son of God. I stand before you a son of God. Right, and I'm, I'm a guy. Okay. You know, my wife sits over there, a child of God, a daughter of God. Would it be fair to say son of God? Maybe, right? We are all God's creation. But John 3.16 is pointing to Jesus as different than, say, me. Jesus is different than you. He is a -a one-of-a-kind, unique son because he is part of the Holy Trinity. He is part of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Like, we are God's creation. Jesus is part of the Creator, Uh, you could say Jesus, in fact, is the creator if you read John chapter 1 and connect that to Genesis chapter 1. So uh, this idea of this one and only son is important. And I think as we look at the Old Testament, you realize uh, in for the Jewish race, if you will, um, the Jewish religion and the Israelites, the firstborn son had special importance. Like it was a big deal When you had kids, when that firstborn son came, it was special. Like a father's inheritance would go to the firstborn son, unless the father changed that for some reason. And it it happens. You could see, you know, like Jacob and Esau, it it changed. Like you can give away your inheritance and stuff like that. But why is the firstborn son given so much importance biblically? And here's what I believe. I don't think it's just about genetics. My firstborn son happens to be, you know, like my namesake, etc. I think, and I've never heard this said before, but I believe it's because Jesus is the firstborn son. He is a -a one-of-a-kind, unique, one and only son of God the Father. And I think it shadows or foreshadows Jesus. And the father goes to great lengths to honor the son. And I think that's one of the things where the father is honoring the son. 
You know, I wasn't the firstborn son in our family. I was actually the last-born kid of five, second-born son. Like, I have no special honor. But you know what? Jesus does. And I think that's what God wants, that we give Jesus all the honor and praise. You know, and, and we look at people in the Bible who, you know, um, King David, he says, you know, he's running around dancing naked or close to naked, whatever. He's like, I will be even more undignified for God. God doesn't act, ask us to be dignified. He asks us to be true to him and to his son. And this idea here, and probably most of you could have quoted this or something similar to this. This is the NIV, right? Most of you know this, or you could have given us an idea. If I was say, hey, what does John 3.16 say? Most of you could probably give me an idea of what it said. You know it. And I think we know it so well, and I could recite it without even looking at it, uh, but I think we know it so well does that surprise you that your pastor could recite John 3.16? Uh, probably a few of you. Um, is because it's talking about us. In relationship to God the Father and God the Son, and then you have you. For God so loved the world, everybody, that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him, now belief is an action word, not just an intellectual belief as I often talk about, that we will not perish but have eternal life. So, you know, Elder, all sitting back there, uh, he could sit there in comfort saying, I have eternal life. I will not perish because I know the Son and I believe the Son. And we find such comfort and, uh, what's, what's a great word? Um, such, like, it, it's incredible, isn't it, that we are saved and we didn't deserve it. Like, I stand in front of you, a great sinner, knowing that all those sins are forgiven, that you can't cast them up at me, you might. But Jesus forgave every one of them. And we are very comfortable with this. And we could talk about John 3.16 every Sunday for years and not exhaust the message. In fact, when I was in seminary, they talked about, uh, there was this preacher, a very famous preacher for the day. I think, I don't know who it was, John Anderson or somebody that we don't really know. It wasn't like Billy Graham. But uh, every Sunday evening for years, he preached about John 3.16. That was his text. And he never preached the same message. But John 3.16 should humble us and cause us to be thankful. But we got John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. Hey, we as a church, we are all about Jesus. And that will drive some people nuts. They don't want to be all about Jesus. They want to talk about other things too. Like I should be up here talking about how you should manage your personal finances, right? Um, well, tithe and then spend your money carefully save some money okay we're done with that but man talk about Jesus coming so that sinners like me and like you can be saved is great but we can't hoard this because knowing I'm saved and knowing how to be saved should prompt us to move outward and not hoard this we got John 3.16 right we're good with that we love it ah <sighs> You know, and it's why the Reynolds family can be on the other end of that camera watching me talk right now while they are mourning because Charles passed away and they will miss him. They are celebrating because they know he knew John 3.16. And they, just like us, we hope to be where Charles is right now. Now I'm just going on what I know about, what I've heard about Charles. I didn't know him real well. Um, Right? I trust that he was a man of faith. And if he is a man of faith, he is in the presence of Jesus right now. So we got John 3.16, but here's where we fall apart. Like John 3.16, that's it, right? Now wait. I said there were going to be two verses, right? We read 3.17. Let's look at 3.17 again. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him and we need to be very careful with this because we're really good at it we're kind of cynical and you know we're saved but then we look at other people who are living in a life of sin different than we are um, and we will be critical upon them and I, as, as usual I will stand in front of you as a hypocrite because I will do this some I need to improve at it Jesus didn't come to condemn people like the children. 
whatever you were thinking when these kids were running up and down the aisle or whatever they were doing, I don't know, cartwheels, chewing gum, I don't know. Ah. Jesus was like, let the little children come to me. And there you have, you're looking at Jesus. Well, you're looking at artwork that depicts Jesus. right? He's like, let the little children come to me. I want them to want to be in my house. Jesus used his power to empower people, not to enslave them. Man, I mean, Jesus, the Son of God, is the one who could condemn people, literally and figuratively. And he chose not to do it while he was on earth. He came with this perfect balance of grace and truth. And this is where we struggle because as people, like you're, you're all people here, we tend to be weighted on one end or the other. Like some of us are very gracious, like anything goes, like, you know, like a flower child. Yeah, do whatever you want to do. God's okay. You'll be forgiven. Yeah, you know what? You want to do that. That's okay. You know, Jesus came so you'll be forgiven. Like anything goes. Okay, maybe you've gone too far on the grace side and you're eliminating truth, right? Grace is winning. But then there's other people oh, that are very legalistic that will take the law to the letter and enforce it as it's written without any grace. So you have the truth down, but you've gone so far, you know, and and this is where we need to try to get this balance because Jesus, as we're told, I think it's John chapter 1, he came in the perfect balance of grace and truth. Remember the story of the woman that was caught in adultery? Just to remind you, I'll put it up on the screen. Oh, Christians and social media versus Jesus. Uh, uh, On social media, Man, Christians butcher this. And religious leaders, like I'm in a church leaders group, I, it might be called church leaders, I, and just the discussions on there make me sick. Man, we need to be gracious to people. You, you know the saying, and you see this out there if you're on social media, I'm only on Facebook, I don't do Twitter or the other things, so I have a limited view, but... Just seeing, you know, you know the saying, uh, it's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. So if you're talking to a gay person and you're right, a person that's saved, and the first thing you say to them or in, or in your discussion, you say, you know, you know what they're doing, that it's sinful, it's a sin, right? And you say, it's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Do you think they're going to like want to have a deeper discussion with you about your faith? Or do you think they're going to say, I'm done with you? Okay, they're sinning. Who here is sin-free? Actually, the the Bible says that if you think you're sin-free, you're a liar, so uh, you'd be sinning anyway. But we are all still sinners. And most of us, if not all of us, used to be better sinners. I used to sin really well. I've conquered some of that, but I still sin pretty well. So anyway, let's look at this story, uh, the woman caught in adultery, because I relate to this really well. At dawn, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees, these are the religious leaders, brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? This is where Jesus gets this perfectly right, and we screw it up. Maybe not you. Some of us really mess this up. Because I tend to be legalistic. Okay, this woman is dragged in by the religious leaders. Right? These are the Pharisees. Back then, Pharisees wasn't a bad word. Like, we think of it as a bad word. The religious leaders bring this woman and say, hey, This woman was caught in the act of adultery. We have all these witnesses to what she was doing. The law of Moses says that she should be stoned to death. So if I'm there, I'm looking for a stone. Man, I have played this in my mind so many times. It disgusts me. And I'm still doing it. You know, we see news stories, you know, there's all kinds of atrocities and horrible things going on, right? There, you have school shootings, you have people molesting children, you have people, yeah, just watch the news, I don't need to tell you. 
And I hear these comments, especially on social media, like, well, that person's going to get what they deserve, or they're going to burn in hell, or they should be castrated, or whatever. Yeah, that person's going to rot in prison, or, you know, become somebody's whatever in prison. And, like, for some reason, we find joy in that. They're going to get what they deserve. Man, I am so glad I'm not going to get what I deserve because of what Jesus has done. Because I'm sure if I read through the law of Moses, have you read the Ten Commandments lately? Like, I'm sure I broke some of them. But look what Jesus does. You have this woman guilty of adultery. I don't know where the guy is in this story. She, you know, but he's not there for whatever reason, probably because of the Jews and the way they looked at women um, at the time. What do you say? They're asking Jesus, what do you say? But what do you say? This is where we need to really do a self-examination and put ourselves into the Scripture and be honest about it. And my guess is we're all over the place. If, I, if we surveyed, like, what would you think if you were there at the time? Ah, oh, man, you know, I'm looking for a rock. And from past history, I would pick up something that actually technically isn't a rock. It'd be something else. But, uh, you know, that's me. What do you say? They were using this question as a trap. And I'm not trying to trap you. I'm trying to encourage you to be more like Jesus in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. Now, Religious people love to try to say, what was he writing? Let me tell you what Jesus was writing. We don't know. We don't know. You know, you might have some fun discussing it and guessing and have your reasons for what you think he was writing. Nobody knows as far as I know. Verse 7, when they kept on questioning Jesus, he straightened up and said to them, let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Jesus makes it so real. And here he is showing such mercy and grace. Undeserved. The, the woman deserved to die by the law. Right? If they would have stoned her to death, they would have all been not guilty of murder. Because they were just fulfilling the law. In fact, people would have looked at them as being righteous because they fulfilled God's law. Jesus says, who is without sin? So, who here didn't misbehave as a child in church? Man, being the fifth of five kids, my, me and my brother, we misbehave in church. And my parents were, uh, in a way, insulted because of our behavior. You know, whether it was the time that the priest just stopped and stared at us. They're probably staring at my mom, I'm guessing, or my dad. You know, things like that. Um, it's hard. You're raising kids. Kids tend to be kids. Kids should be kids. Anyway, let's keep reading, see what happens here. I'm kind of curious now. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. Notice what it says next, because this is really important. The older ones first. Now, why is that important? Because I am old enough to know that as you get older, you get wiser. The ones with the most wisdom walked away first. And they said, he's right. None of us, I'm sure they probably weren't saying that, they were probably cursing under their breath because they were trying to chap Jesus and, they, and Jesus in his wisdom wouldn't let them trap him in a lose-lose situation. If he says stone her, he's condoning her murder. If he says let her go, he's violating the law. So he doesn't say either. He actually says a lot. Not like our politicians. They don't answer, like, usually don't say anything. They say a lot of things, but don't say nothing. But Jesus says a lot. Whoever is without sin, cast a first stone. Let's get on with this. And the oldest ones first until Jesus was left with the woman standing there. So now it's Jesus and the woman, nobody else. Now Jesus is without sin. He could actually pick up a stone and, you know, put her to death based on what he said. Let he who is without sin, which Jesus was the only one. 
cast the first stone. He could cast the first stone. Of course, he doesn't do that. But stay with me here. Uh, Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she says, No one, sir. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. So here, Jesus, he has this perfect grace and mercy. No one condemns you. And he says, not even I. Woman, I don't condemn you. Like she was literally just caught in adultery, as far as we can tell from the story. She was just caught in sin, serious sin. And they bring her for Jesus. And we know the teachings of the Bible. If you want me to preach against sin and adultery and sexual impurity or lying, stealing, I, I could do that, and I do. Like, we know that, right? We know the Ten Commandments. And she's caught red-handed and put in front of Jesus, and he says, I don't condemn you. But that's not all he says. Grace and truth. Go now and leave your life of sin. Because we know what sin does, right? Most of us here know the Bible well enough. We, we've been in Sunday school. We know the teachings. Sin is from Satan. Jesus was sin-free. We are not. Jesus is what we need to save us from sin. And Jesus, while he's saying this, he may be thinking, I know what it's going to take for this woman's sin to be forgiven. It's going to take me to be nailed to a cross and, and murdered. She will escape being murdered, but I will not. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. We need to read Scripture in a way that engages our hearts, our minds, and our actions. Because we are all so far from Jesus. I'm first in line, on the back end of that line, probably. But man, when we read the Scripture, I don't know how often you read the Bible. Some of you, I'm sure, every day in chunks. Some of you might read a verse a day, you're doing devotional. Some of you, not at all. You know, that's between you and God. But when you read it, don't feel like you need to read a lot because the person that's reading a verse a day might be getting a lot more out of it than the person that's reading a chapter or a book a day. Because if you hit a verse like John 3.16 or 3.17 and you read it, man, and it captures you. That is God capturing you. It's His Holy Spirit speaking into you as you, you know, just soak in it. Immerse yourself in it. Live in it. What were these people feeling? What would I have been feeling? What would I have done? Let's get engaged in this book because it's a book of information, but more so it's a book of transformation. If we are not changing, we have a problem and we need to look with fresh eyes. And we will all hit that from time to time where it becomes dry and we need to maybe just find a way to get refreshed. But here's the thing, Jesus knows you completely. Just like that woman caught in adultery, he knows all of her sins. Like, it's no surprise to Jesus that she was caught in adultery. But even though he knows you completely, he loves you completely. And most of us, probably all of us, don't really understand unconditional love because we've never really experienced it. Because we are around people. And people always seem to have conditions. This unconditional love comes from God. It's what Jesus Christ offers us. When you receive the Holy Spirit, it is what God gives you. Like, I like gifts, right? Most of us like gifts. God gives us the best gift. Like, I talked about tithing 10%. Like, you get 90%, he gets 10 God says, no, I'm giving you 100 100%. You have access to all of this. So, what can we learn and apply from this message? Now, maybe the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about something different. Like, these are not exhaustive lists when I do this, uh, but these are some ideas. I should read Scripture planning to learn and apply it. You know, you could leave here today and say, man, that was a good message. 
or maybe some Sunday you might leave here and say, that was a good message. But if you don't change, nothing changes, what good was it? It's like taking a multivitamin, swallowing it, and have it not dissolve and just get pushed out through your body. It was useless, which is one of the problems with vitamins, by the way. A lot of them don't dissolve, um, from what I understand. Uh, Number two, I can walk confidently in God's love and empathy. God loves you, right? Period. Empathy is a tricky word. There are different definitions and applications. Um, the, the one I, when I was looking up the definition of empathy, it used the word that's a synonym, synonym, pity. God pities me because I continue to sin. But God understands us, like Jesus understand that, understood that woman caught in adultery. Number three, if I shall not perish... John 3.16, live like it. Hey, you know what? Last week I talked about living to 150 years old. You might do that. But guess what happens if you live to 150? Well, if I'm stopping there, it means you die. We are all destined to die, I mean, short of the second coming of Christ. But we will die from this earth. This body will fail at some point. But I will continue to live in eternity. And if we believe that, if you believe that you will live in eternity in the kingdom of God, don't get so hung up on this stuff. Don't get so hung up on this life, but live like you will live for eternity in the kingdom of God, knowing that there are people that you would like to have there with you. See, if, if you are a person that I am 100% confident that I am saved, that when I die, I'm going to go and be with God. If you're in that, you know, even if like, you're not 100%, but like 99%, like, yeah, you know what, I'm pretty sure. And then you look at somebody that isn't, and you're perfectly comfortable and okay with it, man, you need to go back and read this stuff because Jesus wasn't okay with it. Which takes us to number four. I will reach others with the heart of Jesus. If you have received Christ as your Savior and the Holy Spirit's living within you, you will reach other people with the heart of Jesus, right? By seeing how you live and behave as a Christian, it will affect some people. But will you intentionally reach people? Because God gave us that command. And number five, who could I stop condemning and criticizing? So think about the person that you're the most critical of. Probably somebody pretty close to you. Somebody that you know pretty well, most likely. Could you stop being so critical of them, knowing that that's not the purpose of this life. There are greater things in this life. You know, you you might yell at your kids, make your bed. Would Jesus yell at them for not making their bed? Probably not. He'd say, hey, you really should make your bed. Or, you know, I forgive you this time, but, you know, going forward, start making your bed. Or offer some better rewards for them making their bed. But who are you condemning? Is it a person, a people group, a particular sin group? You know, Jesus didn't come to condemn. Go back to John 3, 17. Jesus didn't come to condemn anybody. He came to reconcile sinners to a holy father. And that's what we are tasked with. So, anyway, I know this has been pretty draining for me, uh, this message, But there's some great news. Coming soon, we're beginning a sermon series, actually next Sunday, Presence-Based Living. Living your life as though Jesus is right with you all the time. You know, it's kind of like that idea of, like if you're in a meeting, and like when the elders meet, we should set up an empty chair there, presuming that Jesus is sitting in that chair, that he is right in the meeting, he is right in the worship service with us. So when we're singing the closing song and you're you know, just kind of going through the motions, what are, what's the closing song? God, so, how does that go? For God. So if you're just going through the motions, God so loved the world, what time is supper? You know, you're not presence-based worshiping. Anyway, this is exciting, so I hope you all come back, uh, Presence-Based Living, beginning next Sunday. So let me pray for you, and then we will worship God 
right? God wants worshipers who will worship in spirit and in truth. So throw your spirit into the worship as we close it in this, with this song, and let me pray. Almighty God, help us to honor you with our actions, with our words, and in choosing to know more about you and to live more like your son, Jesus Christ. It, this will take you and your spirit involved in our lives for us to change a little bit. And Lord, I know that you are willing for us to change, so help us with it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, before you leave here today, drop the rock. Let's go out into the world and look like Jesus. And I know you're looking at somebody that's far from perfect. Nowhere near looking like Jesus, but if we are willing to try, I'll try with you. Let's go out into the world and try to be Jesus to people who are perishing and to people who are saved, because we can't tell which is which. So go in peace, love other people, do something to love somebody. You keep hearing about things, you know, Keith's dad just died. Maybe you reach out to them. You know, when I send a prayer list out, look for something that's on there. People are hurting. Look for somebody that's not here today that is sitting at home lonely, alone. You are the hands and the feet of Jesus if you will take that up. So pick up your cross and carry it exactly where Jesus tells you to carry it. Praise God and God bless you. Amen.